Okay, welcome, welcome all of you to IIT Bombay. And those of you who are familiar with our training methodology, I need not add much to it, but for the benefit of our friends who are joining in for the first time, uh, this is a very ambitious project which we have been running successfully for several years, and we now try to train 10,000 teachers at a time uh, in specific subjects. Uh, we started with a regular two-week program for the teachers and we found out that it was difficult for the participating teachers to move away from their place of work for two full weeks, move away from their families and so on. And there was a pressure to reduce the physical number of days for which they have to remain absent from the work. And that's the reason why we were looking at different models of uh, modifying our training programs. Now this new model envisages, it is still a two-week ISD workshop, but it envisages one week equivalent of work to be done by participating teachers ahead of the physical face-to-face -face interaction. And this work has to be done alone from one's own home or place of work over a period of about four weeks, commissary. Four to five weeks, actually, would like five weeks, so that one day of equivalent work in one week to be done. We already experimented with this model in the computer programming workshop, which recently concluded uh, for the coordinators. The main workshop is start on 12th. Uh, in order to ensure that this new methodology is understood and adapted by all our coordinators, we have extended the coordinators workshops itself, which used to be one week IST workshops. They will now be two week IST workshops, of which one week equivalent of work the coordinators are expected to have done before coming here. I'm sure you would have all done that. Yes. How did you like that activity, doing it alone? Well, maybe good, maybe not very good. You do not know how effective it has been. But let me tell you, our experience is that when people work over an extended period of time and then come here, they're far better prepared to interact. They have very specific questions to ask. They have very specific doubts to clear and it is far more effective. Uh, it is also logical because if you look at the way a subject is taught in our colleges, it is spread over one week. You never teach a complete subject in just two weeks duration. You teach it over a period of uh, 13, 14, 15 weeks so that there is enough time for people to assimilate whatever they have learned. And that physical duration for assimilation is very critical. If it is critical for students, it is obvious that it should be critical for everybody, including us. And that's the reason why we found this methodology to be used. There is an attendant benefit, and I will take a couple of minutes to uh, tell you about that. And that is the financial outlay in conducting such training programs. When we presented the budget, uh, so let me tell you some figures. Uh, the Typical QIP or IST workshops that are conducted in a traditional way where 35, 40 teachers assemble at a particular place. And let's say at your place you are organizing such a workshop, you would put together four or five faculty members who are experts and they will sort of train these 35, 40 teachers. The AICT approved budget for such workshops is typically between 12,000 to 14,000 rupees per participant. This is natural because the participants will come from all over the country. So you have to spend money on their travel, you have to spend money on their stay, on their food. Plus, the three or four experts who conduct that program, their cost, they will have to be paid honorarium, some of them will have to be invited from outside. There will be some local technical support that would be required to conduct the workshop. Those people will have to be paid some honorarium. All of that gets amortized or spread only over 35, 40 participants. Therefore, per participant cost increases. It is in this context that we first started our 1,000 teacher training program, where we proposed that we can bring down the cost to about 9,500 rupees per participant. We ran that program, we ran about 15 workshops. A large number of teachers were trained. When we say 1,000 teachers, it was not exactly 1,000 teachers in any workshop. Some of you have participated in the earlier workshops would know. 
there would be 600, 700, 800 teachers, but still substantially more than 35 or 40 teachers that we would train. Uh, two years ago, in, in 2012, in fact, the ministry asked us whether we can scale this up further. And that is where we took this step to enhance the training magnitude to cover 10,000 teachers at a time. The first pilot workshop that we had run, some of you might be familiar with that, it was on research methodologies. It was run from a large number of centers. And it was very well received. From a financial angle, we were able to submit a proposal which reduced the per participant cost to 6,200 rupees, which is less than half the cost of the conventional workshop. However, the MHRD and in particular the Secretary of Higher Education, Mr. Ashok Thakur, observed that 6,200 rupees is a very good figure at a very low cost, you are able to train people, but look at the total expenditure. For 10,000 teachers, the total expenditure comes to about 6.2 crore rupees. Now, 6.2 crore rupees is a large sum in absolute numbers. The number of people who are getting benefit of also large, but still, is it sustainable? So this is the question that he asked. We propose to run 15 workshops. We have a large budget, largest MHRD has ever spent on training teachers. He asked me this question, the number of teachers in engineering colleges alone are lakhs. We are going to train about 1,50,000 teachers in 15 specific subjects. Then he says, look at the higher education scenario, arts college, commerce college, science college. And it is well understood that most of our teachers need some kind of orientation program for the subject. As I have observed many times, we are the only community of workers in this modern world where we do not get any on-the-job training at all or before the job. The students whom we train, the engineers and scientists and others, whenever they join a job, they have a training program, right? Three months training, three months orientation, something. We are the only jokers in the pack who get a degree and we are told, OK, start teaching from tomorrow. Now, that is, OK, the fact that all of us still manage to do something is because we then innovate. We learn from our peers, we learn from our seniors. But by and large, what happens is we tend to teach the same way we have been taught. Now, if we are lucky and we have been taught by some exceptionally good teachers, we try to emulate them. But if we were not that lucky, or we do not have an opportunity to emulate good people, we continue to teach in the same classical way, perhaps resulting in not very efficient and effective delivery of education to students. That is the reason why I was very keen on training teachers of some kind. And you will notice that in the subjects that we teach, by the way, we also try to incorporate elements of pedagogy or methodology of effective teaching. The one important thing which all of us have realized over many years here, for example, is an effective teaching is not the only ambition that we should strive for. Because no matter how well we teach, unless we care about whether students are learning effectively or not, the teaching is not very effective. Ultimately, the impact has to be felt by the students. Anyway, I digress a bit. Coming back to the financial model, Mr. Thakur asked me that this effort has to be sustained, and therefore, this has to be a self-sustaining effort. There's a big argument in the project approval board, by the way. I said that technically when people are trained, like when we train students, students pay fees. When uh, employees are given training, they are not paid the normal salary. Employees who are being trained are paid some kind of a stipend. There are many companies which insist that during the training period, people will not get any salaries. Effectively, the training is supposed to be paid for by the people who are getting trained. My argument was twofold. My argument was that the teachers are not the highest paid community. In fact, in one heat of the moment, I argued when somebody gave an example of TCS or Infosys during the training program, uh, what kind of stipend they are given and the teachers are paid full salary. I said, what salary do you pay our teachers? I said, you guarantee that you will pay all teachers six months after the training the same salary that TCS or Infosys pays to their programmers. And I guarantee that teachers won't mind paying money for training. So then there was a counter argument saying that, yes, you're right, but the teachers' salaries have been improved re recently in the Sixth Pay Commission, and therefore teachers should be able to spend. 
the crux of the argument that finally prevailed was, yes, in the long term, if I'm getting trained, I should be willing to pay for that training. But in the short term, to get our teachers into that mold of thinking, where they see a benefit in such training, long-term benefit, and therefore they are willing to pay, it will take some time. What was agreed upon is progressively over three years, we'll keep on tweaking the model where the expenditure becomes less and less and more and more portion or burden is borne by the participating teachers. One indirect advantage of making this two-week program split into an online portion and a face-to-face -face portion is that the cost per participant to the project reduces significantly. Please observe that most of the cost that is spent is still on the local travel, the food, the tea, the uh, coffee, the uh, food, and some stay arrangements for outside participants, maybe 10%, 20%, the local honorarium that is to be paid for the services that are rendered by you and your colleagues, etc. So if I reduce the physical duration of interaction, obviously the price comes down, and we estimate that our cost would be as little as about 3,500 rupees per participant, or the equivalent. We presume that eventually, in the third year, that is 2014, uh, 2015 onwards, there may be a move to make the participating teachers pay for the training program. But that is long term. Currently, this is the process that we have. An important aspect of the modifications that are happening here continuously in our training program is the realization that increasingly the technology usage in the normal teaching has also increased significantly. For example, in IIT Bombay, we cannot imagine a course being conducted unless there is a back-end Moodle which does all the registration for students, where students submit all their assignments online. There are no paper submissions anymore. Grades are submitted online. We would like to ensure that all our participating institutions, not only the 250 institutions represented by you, which are amongst the better institutions in the country, but all 5,000 engineering colleges adopt technology to this extent. You are familiar with the massive online open courses that have started, the MOOCs courses. The MOOCs have had a mixed uh, uh, feedback from the learning community globally. Very large number of people indeed registered for these MOOCs courses, many benefit, but a large number of people also drop out. There has been a set of detailed studies on the pros and cons of MOOCs. Uh, I was invited to give a paper on uh, uh, effective use of MOOCs in Indian education for Indian engineering students. So I had given that paper, I presented it in February. It's called the Blended MOOCs for Indian engineering students. I would like you all to read that paper. It envisages essentially making the massive online courses available by the best of breed, well-known teachers and institutions or whatever. And they need not necessarily come from IIT system or MIT or Stanford, they could be from anywhere else. But the point is that when they offer this course to the actual students who are ordinarily registering for that course in their own universities, then their universities must accept the MOOC grade as the grade for that university by that student. So if I'm registered for a thermodynamics course in Coimbatore, and I do a MOOC course from Professor Gaitonde of IIT Bombay, then I do not have to appear for separate exams for thermodynamics in Coimbatore. Whatever MOOC's grade I get, it will be accepted by my university as grade. This avoids the double work, and this makes it obligatory for me as a student to do everything diligently. To help me do that online course properly, I have suggested a flipped classroom use because I have some teachers teaching me thermodynamics in the conventional way in Coimbatore. Those teachers will now be expected to do something different. Gaitonde will tell them that, look, so far you are probably using my book or notes as a reference. Now use my lectures also as a reference. So you don't have to waste your time. 85% of the time of us teachers is spent in preparing for lectures and delivering lectures. And only 15% at the most we spent on interaction and that too through evaluation and so on. So this takes away that burden. So my teacher in Coimbatore will now engage me three hours a week, only discussing problems, explaining harder concepts, hand-holding weaker students, challenging smarter students. This is the activity that the teacher will be able to do because the teacher will be free to do so. The third thing that the local teachers will do is that they will give local assignments 
uh, group assignments, individual assignments, because online evaluation which is done by MOOCs is often limited to multiple choice questions. And you know that when we train engineering students, we need to train them in writing long answers, project reports, etc. Now these are best done through course projects, which are very prevalent in IIT system. In many of your colleges also, you might be giving a subject-specific project for those students during the semester, typically in half semester or something. What I have suggested additionally in that model is that if my teacher in Coimbatore gives me an individual assignment or gives a group of students some group assignment, then the teacher will guide us through that assignment and will also evaluate that assignment. More importantly, the evaluated assignments marks will be given by that teacher in Coimbatore to Professor Gaitonde here. And Gaitonde will factor those marks in the final grade. So suppose the final marks are say 100 and Professor Gaitonde conducts the online exam for about 80 marks up to 15 or 20 marks credit will be given to the local evaluation by a teacher. It's very interesting to see the perception. My friend, Professor Mahesh Appa from uh, Vishweshwara Technical University, the Vice Chancellor, he says, ah, Professor Fatak, you're talking about internal marks given by the college and university. I said, no, sir, I'm not talking about that. I mentioned to him that your internal marks often mean, for example, practical marks. They are called internal marks. But most colleges are required to appoint an external examiner to evaluate students. The internal marks, according to the notion in IIT, they might in most places, are marks given by the teacher who has actually interacted with those students. So if my teacher in Coimbatore handles a batch of 60 students and gives such assignments and so on, it is that teacher and that teacher alone who will evaluate all 60 of us. Nobody else. Not the college, not the university. That is our notion of giving stature, responsibility, and accountability to individual teachers who teach the specific. This model has been very well accepted. We will be starting to offer this model to some select institutions from July. Uh, we are going to offer two courses under this mode. We are, of course, targeting only the autonomous colleges to begin with. Uh, before expanding large scale next year. But we do expect up to 60, 70,000 students from some 50 or colleges to benefit. Uh, these two subjects will be thermodynamics by Professor Gai Tonde, as I mentioned. The other is a CS101 course, programming course, which I'm teaching myself. Needless to add, the colleges and universities which accept this blended model will have to accept the syllabus of this course as an acceptable syllabus for their corresponding. The syllabi, etc., will not be changed. This is also an attempt to ensure that some sort of a common standard syllabus is accepted all across in the eventual. Now I come to this course on networks. Computer networks is an important topic. And I'm very glad to introduce to you all Professor Kameshwari Chevrolu, my colleague. Uh, she looks very young, isn't it? She is very young. But she has been a remarkable teacher. She is amongst the few of us in IIT Bombay who have received excellence in teaching award. And she is probably the youngest recipient ever. So let us give her a big hand. She's an extraordinarily accomplished teacher. In, in IIT Bombay, we have often uh, encouraged the faculty members to join in pairs. I call it a two-body solution to a problem. Her husband, Professor Bhaskar Raman, is also a professor, my colleague in the Department of Computer Science. And what we have found is that whenever we have such two bodies as faculty members, it's a very stable pair. Because even if one of them wishes to go away somewhere, the other fellow holds back. So that is a very useful strategy. You might want to adapt it in your places. Anyway, I digress. Now, she has been experimenting with teaching and learning, just like many of us do, but very effectively here. And she is amongst the few of us in IIT who have practiced a flipped classroom model for quite some time. You're already familiar with that model. The model is that students are supposed to listen to the video recorded lectures in their club, in their hostels or wherever. And in the classroom, you have only discussion on tutorial session. She has run this flip classroom in this fashion. There are several others, uh, Professor Kannan Mahugalya, my colleague, who is a uh, coordinator of all national mission projects in IIT, has been doing it with his course on process control for last several years. More recently, Professor Sridhar Ayer, my colleague from Computer Science Department, 
and also used to be a networking person, but now he works exclusively in educational technology. He ran this flipped classroom model in a kind of controlled exercise. We have some 700, 600 students in CS101, and he broke them into two batches. One batch which did experiment using some special techniques of think, pair, share. The other batch we did not. And he could prove without any ambiguity, sufficient statistical samples, that the modern methods make for much better learning by the students. Okay. So this is the methodology that we shall be following. We expect to be followed in the actual delivery of the course. But as far as teacher's training is concerned, the teacher's training will be conducted in the conventional mode with the difference that all the 10,000 teachers or whatever the numbers that register, they will have to undergo for five weeks of uh, work online before coming uh, face to face at your respective remote center. Those of you already been working with us would know this, but for the benefit of others, let me tell you the very, very critical thing in these training programs. Well, Professor Kameshwari is the professor in charge of this course and she is delivering it from IIT Bombay. If I'm a teacher coming to your remote center as a participant from some small place, okay, for me, I'm not physically coming to IIT. I'm not physically interacting with Professor Kameshwar. Of course, I will be listening to her lectures which are transmitted live during the morning sessions. But if I have any problem, if I have any doubt, that needs to be clarified locally by the local remote center. So please understand that for me as a participant, you as the coordinator are the direct representative of Professor Kameshwar. And your institute and remote center for me is IIT Bombay. I hope you appreciate that. For a teacher coming to you as a participant in a workshop, I am coming to you because a course is being offered by Professor Kameshwari of IIT Bombay. That means I expect you to be IIT Bombay, your institute to be IIT Bombay, and you to be Professor Kam. Now that is both a privilege and a responsibility. And I would urge all of you to use these six days, five days of interaction as effectively as possible so that you can actually impersonate Professor Kameshwari in your call. Don't sign on her check or something like that, but impersonation in all good cells. That is the reason why you have to be constantly in touch with her, both before and during the workshop, in case there is any special problem that is posed by some students. And it is possible that you may not be able to answer some of my questions which I may raise as a participant. It happens even here. When we teach a course, there are uh, often occasions when the students floor us completely. And we plainly admit, oh, I don't know how to solve this problem. There are occasions, in fact, some students come up with better solution than what we have thought. This would have happened with all of you. Because the fact of life is the there are several students in every batch who are smarter than us in those specific topics. It's perfectly fine, acceptable. And in fact, uh, not just acceptable, but encourageable. After all, what is the fundamental objective of us teachers? To make every student better than us, isn't it? Unless we achieve that, we have not contributed as teachers. So we may not end up making every student better than us, but at least if some of them become better, it is good. Now, if that happens, please do not hesitate, not, not only in this workshop, but even later on in your life, I'm telling you, absolutely no issue in simply admitting, oh, I don't know how to solve this. Or, oh, I don't know how, I, or I think what your solution is, is very brilliant. You might have heard this incidence in my life, but I'll take two minutes to tell you how it is important to challenge the students with something which even you may not be fully aware of. This incidence happened when I was a young teacher here, and a friend of mine who was a, uh, who was a chess player in the Institute chess team, I used to be the coach, both of us were students together just two years before that. He came with an electrical engineering paper set by late Professor K.C. Mukherjee to me one day, and said, Fatak, how do you solve this particular problem? I looked at that problem, realized that I could not solve it. I returned the paper to him and told him, I'm a computer science professor. He says, no, your basic degree is electrical engineering, so you should be able to solve it. Then I admitted I can't solve this problem. But by this time, I was a teacher, so I said, why not we go to Professor K.C. Mukherjee and ask him that? He was quite happy. Both of us walked to Professor K.C. Mukherjee's room, 
And when late Professor Mukherjee saw us dangling that paper in the hand, he started smiling. As we reached near him, he, uh, he, he cryptically said, So, Fatak, question number three, huh? So, I sheepishly said yes. He asked us to sit down and he wouldn't say anything. So, the student with me, we finally asked him, Sir, what is the solution? And he looked at him and he says, I don't know. And he was shocked. The final exam paper, if the teacher is saying, I don't know the answer. Then Professor Mukherjee looks at me and says, Professor Fatak, this particular problem is a small part of an unsolved research problem which is pending for the last 10 years. But you know, this batch is so smart, I thought somebody will solve it. <laughs> now, if that had happened in my old university at Indore, the vice chancellor would have been Gerard, syllabus ke bar ka sawal puchak. <laughs> what happened in IIT that evening is more remarkable. This kid, I mean, this whole batch, he, he explained it to his fellow colleagues. And in Hostel 4, where majority of that batch was residing, they had a milkshake party that evening. Milkshake is nothing great, I mean, it's an ordinary drink, but in, I'm talking about early 70s, 73, 74, a milkshake party would be thrown in a hostel only if something extraordinary happens for that hostel. Like hostel has won an inter-hostel hockey tournament, or somebody has won a debating trophy, or somebody has done exceedingly well in a camp. Something extraordinary that happens, the hostel will throw a milkshake party. So when this milkshake party was going on, the general secretary of the hostel walked in, and he was quite surprised, because general secretary should know something great has happened in the hostel, and he had no clue. So he asked them, what's going on? And one fellow said, you don't know? The great professor Mukherjee thinks that we can solve unsolved research problems, so we are celebrating. <laughs> So you see, this is the ethos, and this is the third thing that I would like to tell you, that IITs in general and IIT Bombay in particular is not an institute which or the people, teachers and students working here, the people are the institute, they have not fallen from the sky. The people who run this institute are exactly people like you, we are exactly like you, our students are exactly like you. What is the difference? Is the difference because the lot of JE is catching? Is the difference because we look at teachers' an, uh, incidents very significantly before appointing them? Yes, that may be a factor. Is it because we get large funding? Yes, that may be a factor. But the main factors I would like to tell you what makes IIT is different. I have, like you, I have also taught at other places. Like you, many of you, I have also studied in non-IIT system. And I know that in each of our colleges, there are brilliant students, there are dedicated teachers. I took one year sabbatical leave in 2002 just to visit small colleges in the country. I spent one full year going to some 68, 69 colleges, spending two days with each college, and realized that there is talent in every nook and corner of the country. And there are dedicated teachers. The difference is that such people are in majority in IIT system. The difference is the energy levels which are spent. Our students work not only in academics, but they also work in all other areas, whether it is tech fest, mood indigo, whatever, whatever. So energy levels. And the energy levels can be substantially increased, focused energy levels. There is a greater sense of commitment, both among students and teachers. Whatever they do, students are not necessarily committed only to academics. But if they decide to build, for example, a, a solar energy propelled house, then they participate in the international uh, missions and put something together and put enormous amount of time and effort. The levels of collaborations are significant. There are groups of people who typically, they may not be working collaboratively on each and every problem, but ability of teachers, students to come together for a common theme and work together is very significantly enhanced in the IIT system. And last but not the least, the follow of ethical standards is extremely high and heavy. Now you tell me, none of these things are such extraordinary things that they cannot be obtained in each and every engineering college in the country. It is just that some of us have to become kernels and some of us have to say, we'll change the prevailing uh, you know, chalta hai kind of method and we'll try to make a difference. It is this ethos that also I would like you to pick up when you leave this place and go back. It is not just that you have come here to understand some things in networking. Most of you would know networking very well. You would of course interact with Professor Kameshwari and the team here to 
appreciate how better to teach that subject, what methodology to use that. She has developed a special platform to provide such blended MOOCs and her platform you will notice that there are many such platforms. IIT Bombay itself is now modifying the EDX open source platform to often blended MOOCs. But her platform has been constructed keeping in mind the peculiar needs of Indian teachers and students who wish to offer the course in this man. It is work in progress and you will be using that particular thing both for this uh, program and, and for the 10,000 teachers training program. Please use this opportunity also to look at the various facets of technology that are used in education in general and engineering education in general. We may consider a learning management system as just one of the facts, but it is not so. It makes the mundane administrative task for us teachers very simple and therefore we can spend more time in our teaching. Online examinations is not something that you would be always conducting. This will give you a chance to find out and understand the nitty gritties and the problems that make. Let me ask you one problem and we run an online course in a blended mode and you are supervising the exams in your college in Coimbatore where I am appearing and the exam is being conducted from here and suddenly the internet link snaps. Now as a student what do I do? I do not have an access to online exam. So we are suggesting that there should be a distributed model where the server should be also maintained in every individual college so that a local copy can be used on local area network for people throughout the semester to view the lectures, upload their uh, assignments, give online exams. And every evening or every night, uh, it will be synchronized with the main server. Now, this is something that the global platform makers do not have to worry about. But in India, we need to worry about such things. We're trying to do all of these and much more. I think I have taken uh, more than my fair share of time, but I did want to spend this time with you. I normally say some of these things during the valedictory uh, function. Uh, unfortunately, I will be physically away. My vacation has started two days ago, but as you know, most of us vacation is hypothetical. So it has to be taken because it is available. Otherwise, the institute administration says, please note that no more unlive can be credited to your account. So, so you take vacation. Okay. Uh, so I won't be available here uh, later to interact with you. But please do spend time with uh, both Professor Kameshwari, her small band of TAs, and our labs here. I would like to end with uh, with a acknowledgement of uh, contributions from many, to begin with, Professor Kameshwari herself for agreeing to offer this 10,000 teachers training program and agreeing to consider offering such a course in blended MOOCs for the students subsequently, maybe next year. But uh, the 10,000 teachers who will attend this course should benefit, should probably take away something for which I seek as I said, your own contributions, your own cooperation. So you are the second set of people I would like to thank for coming in such large numbers. I think we have around 250 uh, coordinators. That's a fairly large number, yes. Uh, so you and your institutions, so please convey my thanks to your directors and remote center coordinators. Please ensure that the technical team that you have back home Okay, enthusiastically participates in supporting because you know the the effectiveness of a T10KT program is as good as the quality of audio and video that is seen by participating teachers during the morning lecture, and it is as good as seen during the lab sessions by your lab and mom. So I thank you and your colleagues in advance to ensure that. I must thank a very large number of dedicated team members of my own uh, team here. Some of them are, are standing here. They may, be, uh, they may be appearing a bit relaxed here, but let me assure you that they work day and night, both before, during, and after the workshop. This team is led by Dr. Mukta Atre. Mukta, can you just stand up, please? She is the leader. And uh, we have an able uh, second in command, Mahendra Parmar was there somehow. Mahendra is here. Right. I also see uh, Kanan was there somewhere, yes. She's and Rachna is there, yes. Those are the workshop team. Uh, Kalpana Kannan is sitting there. She's in charge of my content-related uh, activities. The CIS, 
systems that you will see are handled by a table team of system administrators led by Abhilash. So Abhilash is sitting. We have Rajesh Kushalkar here. He and other people are busy in developing the Akash-related uh, uh, applications and content. If some of you have any Akash-related issues, I will request Rajesh and his logistics team to answer them at an appropriate point in time during this workshop. So that's all I had to say. Thank you so much and thank you, Kameshwari. All yours.